Hello. Um, it's been a while since the last time I spoke to you uh, about Jacob Prash. And a number of people have written to me asking when was the next, next part coming out. Um, and it's been delayed for a number of reasons. Um, the first thing I need to say is that we are seriously considering various issues uh, about things that Jacob Prash, David Lister and others in his organisation have done. And uh, for various reasons, I'm, there are some things I'm not going to cover just yet. Uh, but don't worry, they will be coming in the future. Uh, this is not the end. This is only the middle. When I first got involved with this whole issue, it was really by accident and it was something that I didn't really know what I was going to find. But what has amazed me is this has actually been so much bigger than I could ever have expected. I thought this was one little spate where tempers had got raised and that uh, Jacob was upset about something. Uh, but I found it very hard to believe that a Christian ministry, a man that is meant to be a man of God, could have a history going back years and years and years where he's done exactly the same things. And yet various Christians, ministries, have not been prepared to come out and say enough is enough. That has really shocked me. Then we are told of the men who are like women, as Nahum puts it. The homosexual senator of New Jersey, Booker. Booker himself does not deny sexual harassment of a homosexual nature. If you've aborted one of those babies, you lady murdered your own child and God will hold you accountable. Your baby's with the Lord, but you won't be. And it's shocked me because I can't ever remember in the 30 odd years I've worked in the cult field, any cult leader, secular or in any other religious group that has ever used language that Jacob has used, that's ever told the lies that he has told. But more than that, that has his members believing that he's infallible. I find it hypocritical for Jacob Prash to say that the Catholics have got it wrong and there's a problem with them because of infallibility of the Pope when we've actually got Pope Jacob the first. Over all the years I've been able to look back at, because lots of people have written to me and told me the background to these things that I didn't know before, that have written to me over and over again about experiences that they've had years ago. The same picture comes out every time, that Jacob doesn't tell the truth. And I'm gonna point out, as we go through this, some of the ways that I feel that he doesn't tell the truth. But more than that, he damages Christians and he damages Christian ministries. How anyone in any position of authority can accept this man as a Christian leader when he doesn't seem to be working for Christian unity, certainly not trying to keep the unity of the spirit until, as we read in the New Testament, we achieve unity of the, um, of the faith, how can this man go on in the way he has? But I, I'm afraid that very soon this is going to come out into the public domain. Only three weeks ago, I was talking to a journalist from one of the big national newspapers who asked me what was going on with Moriel. Now, that rather took me by surprise that this had been picked up by the secular press. And I was asked several questions. Who is he accountable to? Is he part of a denomination where somebody can actually tell him to discipline him, to stop him from being so abusive? Is he part of any confederation of groups like the 
you know, the EA or anything like that. All I could say was that there is one group, just one group, a confederation of ministers that is part of. And yet so far, all I've heard from them is absolute silence. Pastor Bill Randalls did actually make a comment online about how he disapproved of what was, been, uh, what was being said, and in fact in support of Deborah and Stuart Menelaus. Why did he take that down? Why did he remove it from his site? What did Jacob say about it? They're so pleased that, you know, that he's no longer uh, attacking Jacob. I spoke to Bill Randalls, I sent him emails, and he said, please don't get me wrong, I still don't think that what Jacob's been doing is right, but he is an old friend and I should have thought much more carefully before going public with that. Bill, this has been going on for years. Why aren't you now ready to call a spade a spade? Anyway, let's get on to what I want to talk about. One of the things that interested me was I got a lot of emails, as I said, many of them complaining uh, about Prash and things that they'd done to him, uh, done to them. But there were other emails that I got that just totally bemused me and it made me understand a little bit about the mentality of Prash and some of his followers. One, for example, told me that he was praying that God would curse me. Curse me? This is a Christian saying to another Christian that he's praying that God would curse him. We are told in the New Testament that we're to love our enemies, to pray for our enemies. This seems to be Jacob's uh, type of language. Abuse, not only abuse, but condemnation, judgment, without ever thinking about what the issues are. Either you are an ignoramus or you are a liar, Todd Friel. I'm not judging which of the two you are, but for your own sake, I pray to God you're an ignoramus, because if you're not, you're a liar from hell. There's only one of two possibilities. John MacArthur. Either you are a religious liar or you have somehow morphed into an ignoramus, a historical revisionist who doesn't know what he's talking about. Another person wrote to me a very interesting uh, email. He wrote to me saying that um, he had done some research and had irrefutable proof that I had been working with a particular person. That was very interesting because I didn't even know the person's name. I'd never met them. I'd never spoken to them. But he had proof that I was actually working with them to damage Jacob Prash. That is amazing. <laughs> you know, how could somebody say that? Either he was lying or he was trying to track me into saying something. I don't know. A third person wrote to me telling me about all his wonderful degrees as a scientist and then told me that basically that I was uh, an evil person. And I actually wonder, as a scientist, I would have thought he would have asked to see the evidence. That's what scientists do, don't they? So for that person, whoever gave you your degrees and wherever you got your great scientific qualifications, I'm rather worried that they didn't teach you to check out evidence. And that was an amazing thing. So many of the people that wrote in support of Prash 
Well, none of them, as far as I can remember, asked to see any of the evidence. I was willing to go on film and say that Jacob Prash was a hypocrite. And I offered everybody the chance to get evidence from me. In fact, later on, I was informed that Stuart Menelaus had invited anyone to come and look at his accounts. But you people that have accepted that those dear, that dear brother and sister who are working hard for the kingdom of God, that you accuse of being a hypocrite, a whore for Jesus, and all those other terrible things that were said, But not only that, that they were making money and they were heretics, you never bothered to actually check the evidence out. That I find totally amazing. And I think that in the days when we are told there are going to be more and more false teachers coming up, we had better start checking out things rather than just accepting what people like Jacob Prash says. Now, some of the lies he's told, particularly about me, the thing that he never does, of course, never uses an ad hominem uh, argument, never attacks the person. That's all he did to me, was attack the person. Those I'm going to cover in another, in another place, where there will be a chance for him to give his evidence for what he's accused me of. But there are plenty of other lies that I want to, I want to address. I got a phone call on the day before Christmas Eve from Amos Farrell. He told me that I had written something that was actually, um, could be seen as blackmail against Jacob Prash. I had sent a letter to Bill Randalls. Bill Randalls had asked me if it would be okay for him to forward the content to, to Jacob Prash. And I said, yes. I have no problem with Jacob Prash seeing uh, what I've written. So it raises a question. How does a private email get into the hands of someone called Amos Farrell? I wrote to uh, Bill Randalls and I said to him, Bill, have I in any way tried to blackmail you or Jacob Prash? And he wrote back and said, no, no, you haven't. Just after that, David Lister sent me an email. And the email was a copy of a letter that he was sending out as a Christmas greetings to all the supporters of Moriel. And it was fascinating for a couple of things. And I'm going to raise those in a minute when we come to the, some of the lies. One of the things that he stated very, very clearly was that Moriel UK has nothing to do with Moriel US. Did you know that? That the two organisations are extremely separate. So just bear that in mind, because I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I wrote a reply to David Lister concerning his email, pointing out that what he had written was actually defamatory and that he had walked in, he had done something that was really very, very silly. The next morning, I got a call from Jacob Prash. He wanted to know whether I was a Christian. And I said to him that I am not prepared to talk to you. Not prepared to talk to you for one reason. And that is because I have had testimony from people writing to me saying that people in Moriel had a habit of recording people and then misquoting things back in the public domain. And he said, no, 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 I only want to say one thing to you. Uh, you know, are you a Christian? I said, I'm not, I told you I'm not talking to you. And he then went on to say, well, of course, if you are a Christian, then of course I can't sue you. And I said, look, please feel free to sue me. 
I'm quite happy to be sued. There is not one thing that I have said that I will not stand by in a court of law. So sue me, please do it. I'd be happy for you to sue me. He paused and said, well, of course, I could sue um, Catalyst because that's not a Christian organisation. And I said, look, Jacob, please sue whoever you want, but I'm not talking to you on the phone. I put the phone down. I then sent Jacob, sent Jacob Pr uh, Prash an email via David Lister saying that I was prepared to meet him. However, there would be a condition that there would either be a witness or it would be at my solicitor's offices, my lawyer's offices, for, for you who are American. He's never had the courtesy to reply to that. He's just gone definitely silent. I have been waiting for that writ to arrive because that would come become very interesting and uh, that would then open up things that would come into the public domain that I'm sure Jacob wouldn't want to be in the public domain. Anyway, let's get on to some of the lies that have recently been told. As I say, I'm not going to mention the ones that have been said about me, because as far as I'm concerned, they will be dealt with, and believe me, they will. The first thing that uh, Jacob has been saying is that, you know, they say that Moriel doesn't publish their accounts. Of course they do. They're all on the internet. Well, that's very interesting, because Jacob, the only thing that you publish are the returns of an organisation exempt from income tax. Now, this is not accounts. It is a questionnaire that is filled in by your organisation and sent to the American Inland Revenue Service. Now, it's actually quite amusing because everything I quoted came from your own documents. You claimed you didn't make any money out of selling books and tapes. Your own paperwork shows it. The other thing that David Lister has told me, which I've already alluded to, and that you have also stated, is that Moriel US has nothing to do with Moriel UK. Well, that's fascinating. So a question for you, Jacob, I'd love you to answer. If all your accounts are on the internet, where are the accounts for Moriel UK? They're not published. You're not a charity, so you don't publish your accounts for that. You're not a limited company, so you don't publish your accounts through that. In fact, I don't even know what Moriel UK is. It seems to be a company called Jacob Prash trading as Moriel. Now, if I'm wrong, Jacob, tell me exactly what UK Moriel is and where your accounts are published, because I'd love to see a copy. And I'd like to say to all you Christians out there, why haven't you asked to see the accounts where the money and ask where the money is gone? And then we come to Moriel Missions, which is the is the charity arm of Moriel UK. Has a small account, just over £30,000. Yeah, fascinating. You don't even submit accounts to them. Your last document that you gave them that was supposed to be an account was actually a bank statement. It doesn't say anything about where money was spent, where it was received and what it paid the money out for. So again, any of you that have been giving uh, money to Moriel Missions, do you know where it was spent? I certainly don't. Now, you can point to this, which does have some comments about its missionary work, although it's so vague, you actually wonder what it's about. And you can get a copy of this and I'll tell you how later. So here we have an organisation that says that they publish their accounts on the internet. 
where are the accounts? Where are the accounts for Moriel USA? Because these aren't accounts. They don't give any detail. They talk about expenses of, what is it, total expenses of $500,000. Now, some of that is, you know, you can actually work out roughly where it comes from. Uh, of being grants, that's 126,000. But where does the rest go? I don't take a salary from Moriel. I don't take royalties from my tapes or books or anything like that. I don't take a salary from the ministry uh, or royalties from materials and things. Some money comes to my own personal stuff. This is for Jacob, a love offering for Jacob. Uh, it's probably last year was about 90,000 US dollars. I don't take a salary from Moriel. I don't take royalties from my tapes or books or anything like that. Where does all the rest that makes up $500,000? Talks about income what you and David Lister get. Over 70,000 pounds sterling each. $90,000 each. But there's another question. All the money that was donated by all the churches in the UK and individuals in the UK that sent uh, or came to your conferences and heard you speak and gave money to it, what happened to that? Where's that gone? Has it been disclosed to the, to the, to the American I, 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 IRS? Of course not. It certainly doesn't appear in the accounts or the document that you sent. Secondly, where did it go? Did you pay any money to the UK? Because you've kept on saying that you don't actually live in the UK, of course. Well, that's, of course, a bit of a strange thing, isn't it? Just a few weeks before you wrote to me, or David Lister wrote to me, saying that you didn't live in the UK, there was an email saying that you did live in the UK, that you yourself had sent. Now, what is a lie? Well, a lie has to be, one of those has to be a lie. Do you live in the UK or do you live in the United States? My name is Jacob and I have legal ID saying my name is James. To apply for an American passport as an expatriate and to have obtained British residency and right of abode in Great Britain, I have to show all names that I use legally, James Jacob. That is my legal name for legal reasons because of my situation of having legal identification from two countries that I have to present both to the American State Department and to the British Home Office. That's my name. What happens to all the money that comes into the UK? Who pays for the houses that you've rented in this country? There are serious questions, Mr. Prash, that you need to answer before you start accusing other people. Now, another lie that you told, which I find even more fascinating, you said to the Menelaws, or you said about the Menelaws, that they don't publish their accounts. That is a downright lie. They're a limited company. Their accounts have to be published at, Ch at, at Company's House. Anyone can get onto them by the internet. But to make it easy for you, Stuart and Deborah offered you the chance, anyone, to come and look at them, to ask them any question they wanted. Did you bother? 
No, you just come out with lies. And then we get on to the other lies. Another thing that you've said, Mr. Prash, is that Moriel alone bought 150000 to $200,000 worth of the Daniel project. And you say that your accounts prove it. Well, let's see these accounts. Let's show us this. And if the selling of them is what you report in your document that you gave to the IRS in America, it shows that you bought things and sold them for five times the value. Quick maths on that. Well, you must have made an awful lot of money, about a million dollars out of it. So who's the one that's whoring Jesus? Now, I'm using the logic that you kind of use. Of course, there's no proof of that, because I haven't seen any proof that you actually even bought that number. If the accounts, these documents, show that you buy things at one-fifth of what you sell them at, that would be the, that would be the logic of it. Just same sort of logic you used about Catalyst, used about me. So let's have the figures. Let's show, the, let's show us the information so we can judge. You know, Mr. Prash, I'm getting very fed up with the way that you talk and the way you rant and you challenge people and you argue about people. Come debate me, Mr. Sizer. Debate me, Mr. Church. Debate me, Hank Hanegraaff. Debate me, Darry Burge. I challenge you to a debate here in California, open to the public in front of a video camera, anytime, any place. You are a pseudo-academic fraud, and I can prove it from the Greek text. You want to debate? Just get a camera and I'll be there. You bigoted phony. And I'm particularly annoyed about the lack of evidence that you ever present. You see, there was an interesting point where you said in one of your videos on YouTube that Deborah Menelaus was reported to you as having said something at a conference. You said that two people came to you, two women, and they told you what Deborah had said at that conference. And this was your argument. You said it very clearly. You said, I have no evidence that she said it, but I believe those women, right? I believe those women. Well, do you know something, Mr. Prash? I've had some people talking to me about you, and I'm going to use the same, exactly the same argument. I've had quite a number of people tell me that you have a weakness for Jack Daniel's whiskey. That was the Jack Daniel teaching. And you have a problem with single malt Scotch whiskey. Now, I don't know whether, I've got no proof. I wasn't there when you drank it, but I've got people that say they were there when you did. 
So on your level of proof, it must be true. I can't believe these people would lie about you. A second thing that I've been told, exactly the same as you've talked about other people like Deborah and Stuart, you've said that people have told you, you don't have the evidence. Well, people told me, women told me, got in contact and said that you have a habit of getting very close to people, certain women, and have made them feel very uncomfortable. No, I don't know that it's true. People have told me. Of course, it has to be true. They're good Christian women. Why would they lie about it? See, Mr. Prash, I have come to the conclusion in looking at everything that I've looked at that you just lie over and over and over again. When I agreed to do the Daniel Project and the Daniel connection that was extrapolated from it using footage of me. That film documentary was essentially structured around my narration. Now, many of you will probably know us best as a film production company for this film called The Daniel Project, which is about Bible prophecy. Stuart, I think you're going to have a little surprise for the viewers, though. Well, we uh, had to put together a trailer uh, before the actual production was made uh, so that you could be able to find a distributor at Cannes in France. And so here's a very early trailer that was put together back in 2004. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a very dramatic trailer and it really does bring back memories of how this all began way back in 1990 with our first biblical documentary called Cup of Trembling, Countdown to Armageddon. And before we show you a clip, uh, it was transferred eventually to DVD, although it's only in a standard definition format. But you, you might like to know that originally, uh, here's the original video format, and if you want to hold that, Deb, I'm going to compare it with the masters that we used to have to work with back mm -hmm. in those days. And here it is. Mm. And so that was a kind of technology way back in 1990. But here we have a clip for you. And we wonder if you can recognise two particular people in this clip. Two young things. After much research into the subject, a Scottish documentary team set out to see if these end-time prophecies could actually come to pass. Keeping to a literal interpretation of the Bible, their investigation has led to an astonishing parallel between today's world events and the signs of the end of the age. Before we could even begin to look at what the Bible had to say concerning the end-time prophecies, we had to ask ourselves the question, is what we're reading accurate? Are the documents valid? Or are they just a collection of myths and philosophies? I understood it would be a Christian evangelistic project that would be taken into the world. I agreed to do it gratis, pro bono, no money. as unto the Lord for the sake of the gospel. No problem signing an agreement to do that. But I had no idea someone was going to pull a Pat Robinson and sell it to the secular world. to go to Hollywood or wherever they did, sell it.
How much did they sell it for? I had no problem selling as many of the DVDs as I could. No problem. I wanted to do it for the sake of the gospel. By all means, bring it into the world, market it, distribution, circulation. These people just use the gospel in Jesus and the return of Christ to get money. That's what the world would think. Whatever you paid, Mr. Hitchens, I want to be paid the same amount, only I don't want the money. Give it to Barnabas Trust. Give it to the Barnabas Fund to help persecuted Christians in Islamic and other countries. I don't want a penny. Another thing that you've said, Mr. Prash, is that Moriel alone bought 150000 to $200,000 worth of the Daniel Project. And you say that your accounts prove it. Well, let's see these accounts. Let's show us this. And if the selling of them is what you report, in your document that you gave to the IRS in America, it shows that you bought things and sold them for five times the value. Sell it to the world? Now, uh, another update on the feature film front, the Daniel connection and we've just been told by the distributor that viewers in all the major English speaking countries which includes the USA, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand and others will be available to view in HD or perhaps even in 4K uh, which it was orig uh, originally filmed in. Mm -hmm. Now, we're still awaiting the actual details, but the film will certainly join the many other films out there dealing with apocalyptic events. Although the Daniel connection clearly points to the Bible as the place to investigate regarding the big questions about life and death in this broken world in which we live. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting. Now, apparently, according to one aforementioned rather dubious source, the Chinese who acquired the rights to the film have stopped everyone in the rest of the world from being able to see it. It was sold to Hollywood. And then from Hollywood, it sold on to China. Now, I have no idea how they came to that. What do you reckon, Stu? Uh um, uh, clearly, that's a simple lesson in regard to how unwise it is to listen to dubious sources. <laughs> anyway, we look forward to seeing how it will be received. Certainly, we have had many emails from Christians yeah. who have used a film in evangelistic outreach with yeah. some wonderful accounts of the positive impact that it's had in getting people to open up and discuss biblical matters and ultimately to discuss the question, is there a God? And how should one respond to what the Bible instructs? Mm. And I think, Stuart, uh, we have that everlasting memory of the English premiere, the theatre, 
when a man actually gave his heart to the Lord yes. that night. Yeah. He was an atheist and he believed that God had spoken to him to come to the theatre and watch the film. Yes. And it, that was really, really humbling. Yeah. And by the way, yeah. folks, we've never claimed it to be a great big A, A-list movie. It's, but it's a good B film for what it is. And it's had, it's had some very good reviews. Very, very so, timely just now because it's yes. actually things happening uh, out there in the Middle East, things happening mm-hmm. in the news. Mm-hmm. They're on the film. Yep. <laughs> so it's, it's all to do with God's timing. So uh, talking of which, so let's take a break from the updates and we'll see what's been happening on our Daniel Project Signs of the Times Facebook. I did that to see unsaved people get saved. What we're talking about here is slander and libel against Christian ministries that are seeking to reach the lost and bring them to Christ. And you, Mr. Prash, lie about them. And you never give your evidence. But if you, you think that if you keep on saying it long enough, everyone will believe you. And the amazing thing is, from some of the emails I received from some of your followers, they clearly do believe you. They clearly have never thought that, it, that you could possibly be wrong. Not Pope Jacob I, not the only infall- infallible Christian there's ever been in the world. Mr. Prash. It's time that you stopped doing what you're doing. You are not appointed by God to challenge everybody and attack everybody. You are going to be held accountable for all the damage you've done and for every ministry that is being blessed by the Holy Spirit that you attack and accuse to have the spirit of the Antichrist the spirit of Jezebel or the spirit of Ahab or all the other spirits that you talk about. You are condemning what God is doing. But more seriously, for you Christians out there, for all of you that are still supporting this man, why do you not realise that by giving him money, by supporting him, by accepting his lies without even checking them, You are holding yourself accountable before God for the damage you are enabling him to do. I really, really worry about you. And I pray for you that God would drop the scales from your eyes and make you realise what's going on. Touch not my anointed. I don't have anything in my brain. Because unless this stops, the damage to the body of the Christ is enormous. When I have a, a leading journalist from one of the national newspapers start asking me Christ questions about what's going on in the church, some of you are going to feel very, very embarrassed. But more than that, Christ is being damaged. The body of Christ is being damaged by what you're allowing. So I urge you to think very carefully about what you're doing. And if anyone wants to invite him to their church, I have to say, I do not understand that at all. Be aware that God will hold you accountable. <laughs> 